welcome to the Actual Tech Media EcoCast. My name is Jess and I am excited to be here with you all today. But before we jump into our content, I have some basic information that I wanna cover with you. All right, let's kick off our day here today by taking a quick tour of your audience console. And we're going to start with the questions window. So if you haven't already said hi, there is a whole audience of cool humans out there. So reach out and give a wave to the other members of the actual tech media community. Now, keep in mind that if you do have any technical issues today, a browser refresh is going to fix just about anything. But if those tech gremlins are clinging on today, no problem. Just throw a comment in the question section and our crew will be there to help. We also want this to be an informative webinar for you. So throughout today's EcoCast, we hope you'll get engaged and ask all your burning questions. Not only will we have team members responding to you over a live chat, we will also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of our presentations. Now, if we don't get to your question during the live webinar today, don't worry because the awesome experts that we have here with us will be following up after we wrap. All right, next up, there's going to be lots of cool aha moments on the EcoCast today. And if you want to share those with your community, we've made it nice and easy for you. You can use the Twitter button right there on your audience console and the hashtag for today's EcoCast will be automatically added to your post. All right, our last stop on this guided tour, be sure to check out the handouts tab for some awesome resources and takeaways from our speakers here today. We have an info pack collection, solution briefs, white papers, data sheets, free trials, eBooks, upcoming webinars, and more. So many great resources, so be sure to go explore. Now, if that wasn't enough fun, we also have some exciting prizes that we'll be giving away throughout today's EcoCast. I'm gonna tell you a bit more about those later on, but a few quick reminders for you all. First, you do need to be here live in attendance at the EcoCast in order to qualify to win a prize, and we will follow up with all of you after we wrap. Now, all winners must submit an IRS Form W-9 to Actual Tech Media, and all winners must meet the Actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions. Now, if you don't know what those full T's and C's are, that's fine. We've got the full thing for you. Just head on over to that handouts tab, click in, scroll down to the bottom, and you'll find them waiting for you there. Now, the absolute most important thing to remember is that we love getting all your insightful questions during these live webinars. In fact, we love it so much that we actually have a special additional prize for all you inquisitive folks out there. So in today's EcoCast, we will be giving away a prize for the best question asked in each of our live sessions. Now, the expert speakers and teams will review all questions asked after we wrap the webinar, which means that even if your question does not get read out in a live session, there is still a chance to win. If you are a lucky winner here today and you would like to donate the value of your prize, we have several wonderful organizations that we partner with. So let us know when we follow up about your big win and we'll get that rolling for you. Again, we are so happy to have you all here with us live at the EcoCast today and we want to keep that good feeling going. So let's connect on social media. Reach out and connect with Actual Tech Media on Twitter and on LinkedIn. We have lots of great content and we always want to hear from you. Now, if you're looking for more awesome content and resources right after we wrap the EcoCast today, be sure to subscribe to the Actual Tech Media channel on YouTube. Another fun way to win a prize and, hey, grow this awesome community is to refer an industry friend or a coworker to the Actual Tech Media webinar series. Now, you'll find a link to do that right in your handouts tab, and you will also be automatically redirected at the end of the webinar. And both you and your coworker or friend could win a prize, and we hold those drawings every month. So be sure to refer a friend because, it, hey, it could quite literally be a win-win situation. Next, we have a cool opportunity for all the decision makers out there to get connected with new and emerging tech and innovative vendors. Here's how it works. All you need to do is click on the link in your handouts tab, fill out a quick application, and the actual tech crew will then match you with some vendors that we think you should probably be chatting with based on your needs. There will also be fun opportunities that you get to choose to join in, like surveys, test runs, uh, new solutions, extended demos, and so on. You'll get some chances to win extra prizes, you'll chat with great people, and you'll learn about the hottest new trends in tech. So be sure to apply, or hey, send that link to a decision maker on your team. Now I wanna take a quick minute here to remind you all about one of my favorite resources, and that is ransomware.org. You can find out everything you need to know about ransomware, how to prepare, prevent, and recover. This site is jam-packed with information, helpful tips, checklists, strategic approaches, case studies, everything you need in one place. So wherever you are in your ransomware preparedness journey, there is something for you at ransomware.org. Go check it out and start exploring. 
All right, I have one more exciting resource I have to tell you about today, and that is the Gorilla Guide Book Club. It's going to give you access to free enterprise IT books authored by top industry experts. So you can stay up to date on trending enterprise technology. And yes, these books will work on your Kindle, your mobile device, and as I said, they are completely free. You can download these awesome resources at gorilla.guide, and there's a link for you in that handouts tab as well. All right, well, we have covered a lot of important things already, and I don't know about you all, but I am excited to dive in. So let's get going. All right, so jumping into the good stuff here, because today we are talking about improving security and ransomware pre pre preparedness. Oh. Ransomware preparedness in financial services organizations. Folks, we're like 10 words in and I already can't speak. Well, you're with me though, you get it. So here's the thing, I love when we get to have these detailed and, and really kind of in-depth conversations that dig into the complexities and the opportunities within a specific industry. Because today is all about you. Together as a community, we get to talk about and explore the ways that your financial services organizations can improve, enhance, revise, or power up your ransomware security and preparedness strategies. And obviously, this is all top of mind for a lot of us these days. So I know that you are ready and excited to dive in. And here's the even better news, folks, because today we have two powerhouse teams, Rubric and ServiceNow. These awesome crews have sent their top experts to chat with us about the most innovative solutions, tips, trends, and best practices. I am so excited to be here with you all to be a part of this conversation. I hope that you will all get engaged throughout the day today, ask those questions, post those comments, and get involved in that conversation. Speaking of conversation, let me take a step back and introduce myself one more time. Again, my name is Jess Steinbach. I'm a moderator here at Actual Tech Media, and my friends and fellow moderators, the wonderful David Davis and Scott Becker, are here with us on a live chat. And da -da, prizes. So today on the Ecocast, you could win one of three $300 Amazon gift cards. We will be giving them away to three lucky winners that are here live and present with us at the Ecocast. Now, I mentioned a little bit earlier, but the full T's and C's are in that handouts tab if you do want to go check those out. But we are going to keep moving along here in the Ecocast because we have kind of a cool keynote lined up for all of you today. So we're going to do something a little bit differently. Normally we bring on our speakers and they give us a cool little introduction and then we get rolling with our day. But what we actually wanted to do today was share with you the first few minutes from an expert series session that we had just a little bit earlier this week featuring Alan Liska, who's a CSERT at Recorded Future and one of the foremost experts on the good guy side of the ransomware world, the good guys of the ransomware world. That's an important distinction. Uh, Alan provided a, a fantastic and up to the moment, moment overview of what's going on right now with ransomware trends. So this is a great setup for the rest of the ransomware defense solutions that you're about to hear. And we thought that would be a great way to kind of kick things off. And once we wrap, I'll, I'll tell you where you can find uh, the full expert series. But for now, let's uh, take a look at this fun little teaser trailer that we've put together for you all. We're gonna talk a little bit about where we are with ransomware and what we're kind of expecting to see in 2023. Um, one of the things that I get asked all the time um, is, is ransomware increasing or decreasing? Because there are a lot of conflicting reports out there. And, and the answer is, we're not really sure. Um, uh, it, it's actually getting more difficult to track ransomware attacks because data, le data leak sites or extortion sites um, have become an increasingly unreliable measure. Um, and, and, and so it's hard to see where ransomware stands totally. Um, a great example of that is when the Hive ransomware uh, uh, was infrastructure was taken down in uh, February. Uh, the, the FBI had reported that they handed out over 1,300 uh, uh, keys to victims, that, to, to known victims. And that was just the known victims they could get um, their hands on. Um, you know, so the real numbers probably well over 2,000. But we only knew about 200 Hive victims um, because that was all they had posted to their extortion site. Now, that doesn't mean the other 1,800 paid. There just may be a variety of reasons why they, um, 
why they didn't uh, uh, show up on the extortion site or whatever. So, you know, so that makes it a lot harder for us to get a, a handle on the number. We think ransomware attacks were slightly down in 2022 and that trends continued a little bit in 2023, but we'll see where that, you know, ends up. Um, and the other thing is there's been a diversity in the ransomware market where, you know, in 2021, we were tracking just over 30 extortion sites. Now that number's ballooned, ballooned to over 140. So a big difference in the total number of ransomware groups, most of them small, um, what I like to call handcrafted artisanal ransomware. Um, but, uh, you know, they're not the kind of nice people that you find in a little shop in Vermont. Um, so, you know, don't get me wrong there. Um, what we do know, though, is that along with business email compromise, ransomware is still the most profitable cyber criminal activity. Nothing else has taken its place there. Another new trend that is worrying to uh, me, at least, and to a lot of other people, is we're seeing much more involvement of nation state actors in ransomware. So um, we know that North Korea has always been involved in ransomware, um, at least back since WannaCry in 2017, but they've been much more active lately. North Korea is the only one of these groups that is essentially a cyber criminal group operating as a nation state. They want your money and they will happily take it. Uh, Russia and China um, use, uh, use uh, ransomware as a distraction attack. So they're going after certain targets. Um, and they are deploying the ransomware as they steal data. So it looks like a cyber criminal attack, but really it's an espionage attack. And then Iran is really weird, man, because most Iranian ransomware attacks are uh, distraction attacks. They're either meant to disrupt activities or they're meant to distract for data theft. But then sometimes they actually want to get a ransom. And what we think is happening in Iran is Iran doesn't pay their operators very well at all. And so a lot of them moonlight. They basically take the ransomware home and carry out their own attacks. So you don't know whether you're dealing with an Iranian uh, threat actor who's moonlighting or if you're dealing with the Iranian nation state. Either way, you probably don't want to pay a ransom to Iranian act, um, actor because uh, uh, there are sanctions involved and you can get fined and get in a lot of trouble with that. Russia, in, to me, is really interesting because Russia is primarily known for wipers, right? So what Ru Russia would do is they would deploy wipers, which destroys the system that they were on. But you can see toward the end of last year, they started moving more toward ransomware and away from wipers. They started with wipers disguised as ransomware and then moved to straight up ransomware. That lines up really well when Russia started their conscription campaign. When they started, um, you know, when they realized they didn't have enough soldiers for the invasion of Ukraine. And so they started going out and conscripting people. Most ransomware actors in Russia are of conscription age, like they're the perfect target for uh, conscription age. So what we think happened is Russia came to those guys and said, hey, you can either come work for us and do some ransomware or you can go fight in Ukraine. And they all like, yep, let's go work for you and deploy ransomware. So that's where we start to see that change in tactics from, um, uh, uh, from only wipers to actually using ransomware in their attacks. And again, those same threat actors haven't stopped deploying ransomware on their own. They're just deploying Rus Russian ransomware nine to five, Monday through Friday. And then after five o'clock, they're deploying whatever ransomware they would normally deploy. So, um, you know, that that's kind of where we see this moonlighting um, become a real problem, at least in Iran and Russia, because all they're doing is improving their skills, um, which means they're a bigger threat to you when they go and do their um, when they go and do their 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 sort of off government activities. We are also seeing um, extortion only attacks. So if you all remember last year, Lapsus was really famous for that. You know, they, they broke into Uber, they broke into um, uh, uh, Okta and a few other places, and they would take data and threaten to release it unless you paid them money, but they wouldn't encrypt anything. Um, we're now seeing Karakurt and Bienland as sort of the two leaders in that. Um, 
that you know basically they looks like a ransomware attack up until the data encryption part there is no data encryption you're just your data is copied and held for ransom one of the things that we're not seeing yet and i'm going to knock on wood when i say this but we may start seeing in the future is delete or steal and delete right now it's we say stolen but it's really just copied data um the ransomware actors haven't figured out that they might have a better set of leverage if they actually secure deleted the data and that's why we don't talk about that on twitter or anything else publicly i'm going to share it with you all um we don't want to give them ideas um but it is something to think about in the future because right now we don't know how profitable extortion only attacks are most people realize ransomware actors are lying bastards they are not going to actually delete the data if you pay them a ransom all you're doing is making it so they won't post it to the extortion site. They will sell the, whatever data they've stolen that they think is worth selling. In fact, we've seen that a number of times where victims of these extortion only attacks pay the ransom. The data is not published to the extortion site, but we see that same data set being sold in underground form six months later. Um, so they may have more leverage if they move to let's secure delete the data um, after we copy it off and then it'll um, uh, then it'll be um, more available to them. All right, so as we said, just an awesome talk and that was just the, the teaser, just the tip of the awesome iceberg <laughs> from Alan Liska uh, about what's happening right now. If you want to hear more, if you'd like to see the full presentation from Alan, again, that was an expert series uh, and we just, I think it was yesterday or even the day before, so Actual Tech Media will have that up on our YouTube channel in just a few days. Uh, we'll get that whole session up, so stay tuned for that uh, and make sure you do check out that full session because obviously it's uh, lots of great content there. Well, speaking of great content, we're about to jump into some pretty cool presentations here ourselves. I do have a poll question up on the screen for you all. And what I'm wondering is, what is the time frame that you have in mind for adding new or updating existing IT solutions at your company? Uh, so again, we're talking about these ransomware preparedness strategies. Um, and so when you're thinking about that and you're, you're you know, collecting all your information, are you trying to solve an urgent problem or are you thinking a little bit more ahead? Are you, um, you know, longer term and further down the line. No wrong answers here, just curious, and it kind of helps our speakers know whether they're speaking to you about urgency or a little bit further. Um, I've seen a pretty good mix, so that's excellent. A lot of not sures, which is great and tells me that we have some good information to cover today, some good open minds uh, and folks wanting to collect as much information as you can. So let's get started with that. Let's get rolling with all that awesome information we have to collect today. It is my pleasure to introduce you all to our first expert presenter here on the EcoCast. And we are definitely starting out with a bang because our very first present presenter is Veer Choksi, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Rubrik. Veer, thank you so much for being here to get us started today. Now, I know you have some great content planned for the audience, uh, and I know we're going to leave some time for Q&A at the end. So I will We'll step back and hand things on over to you. Take it away, Veer. All right, so I wanted to start with a little bit of context, and I think most people already know this, but some basic information about the significance of ransomware. So obviously, people don't like to be public about when they've been impacted by a cyber attack or security breach, but the reality is that ransomware is a really pervasive problem. And over a third of organizations in the previous year from this particular survey were impacted by ransomware. And as you can see, the cost uh, associated with ransomware and recovering from it can be in the millions. So that includes payment of the ransom itself and also any other costs that may be associated with that event like downtime, legal, et cetera. And that's to say nothing of the reputational harm and lost business that a ransomware attack can cause. So why is ransomware on the rise? Well, it's a few reasons. So with consumers and businesses operating in a more remote and distributed manner, the attack surface has just gotten bigger and bigger. So it's easier for attackers to get in. Also, there's a a relatively new 
a ransomware economy, which operates on a, it's like a ransomware as a service kind of a business model. And these attackers keep getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, they've also, they've also uh, tweaked their, their methods and, and honed their methods so that they're doing things like double extortion attacks, whereby sensitive data is exfiltrated under the threat of release. So attackers often can go after a victim's backup systems because the backup is your last line of defense. And without having the proper security controls in place, backups are vulnerable. So let's spend a moment talking about legacy backup infrastructure, which uh, can't really keep up in today's era of ransomware. So many backup providers aren't using a true zero trust approach, and therefore there's a high surface area for attack. There's also a limited ability in some of these legacy platforms to detect anomalous activity. There's not too much visibility into sensitive data exposure. So things like customer data, PII and PHI for healthcare organizations. There's also a lack of incident containment capabilities. So that makes organizations more prone to things like getting reinfected when trying to recover. And that just increases the length of downtime. And lastly, the recovery options are lacking as well, which can make recovery slow and complex and costly. So ransomware attacks are shining a spotlight on why it's so important to integrate data security into your data management and IT operations. So what our customers are experiencing today is if you are, if, if an attacker does manage to get past your perimeter defenses and lockdown data, you have two basic options. Option one being to pay the ransom. But even if the ransom demand is met, there isn't a guarantee that the attacker is going to uh, provide the decryption key in, in a fast enough time and that your, your data will be uh, safe and, and of the same quality. And the second option is to attempt to recover. But when you attempt to recover, there's a there's a series of things that need to go right for you to recover successfully. So first, IT and security teams turn to their backup data. And if that data has been compromised, that backup data, you might have no choice but to pay the ransom. So if you do have access to your backup data, can you find data anomalies to assess what applications and what specific data was impacted? Can you find the last known clean copy of data that you can then recover to? And if you have trouble answering those questions, you might have to just pay the ransom. Then there's the possibility that sensitive data might have been impacted as part of the attack. And if you're having trouble discovering what exactly that sensitive data was and where it was, you might end up deciding to just pay the ransom. So even if you go through those steps before initiating an application recovery process, you need to be confident that there isn't malware that's latent in your backup data, because if there is, you might end up reinfecting yourself and compounding the problem and just increasing the amount of downtime. Lastly, you need to recover the critical applications in a timely manner to protect the business. And if you can't get back online quickly, you might have to, you might decide to just pay the ransom. So for many reasons, a lot of organizations are stuck paying the ransom rather than being able to recover quickly and, uh, and with all of your data intact. All right, so reducing cyber risk is not just about using the right technology, although technology is a, a big component of it. We should be thinking about reducing cyber risk holistically. And this is about what we call the four P's, people, process, preparedness, and precision. And the technology element comes in the preparedness and precision pieces, both of which Rubrik offers, and I'll have to speak more about that later. So 
uh, I was talking about the, the four P's of reducing cyber risk, and let's let's go through what those are. All right, so starting with people. So, so, so the first thing here is that not all data is the same, and staff needs to be trained on how to discover critical data assets and classify their sensitivity. You know, some pieces of data are much more valuable or much more sensitive than others, and so education is a big component of, uh, of knowing how to handle it. And the second thing from a vulnerability standpoint, how does the way that your environment is set up and uh, people's behavior as well, how does that impact your risk? Are people using systems in a way that is uh, conducive to security or are they leaving things open, for example, to attack? And then the third thing is about planning and people getting organized and having a game plan. So firefighters, for example, they don't learn how to fight a fire once they arrive at a burning building. So similarly, in, uh, in this area, it's important to plan in advance of an attack actually happening. And then fourth item here, before getting attacked, it's important for the organization to align on the different roles and responsibilities. So for example, what is IT's job? What is security's role? Who else needs to be involved? And what are the right handoffs? And then finally, after doing all this work, it's important to test it, to do things like running exercises and simulations. And this could be a pre-announced drill, or it could also even be a, a surprise drill. The idea, of course, is that practicing regularly will improve your preparedness. All right, the next P is process. So reducing risk shouldn't be thought of as just a one-time exercise. It should be thought of as a continuous, uh, continuous process. You don't just look at risk once and then walk away from it. We should all be constantly evaluating risk and making sure that the organization's philosophy is one of continuous improvement rather than, rather than checking a box. So first thing is risk identification. So that means looking at the security controls that you have across your environment and identifying what actually is the risk. Next thing is risk assessment. So how do you assess the risk and understand the actual potential impact of that risk if something were to go wrong? The next thing is mitigating the risk. So that's taking targeted actions to reduce the risk across your environment. And then the fourth component is risk monitoring. So that's continuously monitoring, monitoring your security posture and implementing the necessary controls and consistently enhancing your security readiness. And the next P is preparedness. So here's where we start getting into the actual technology. So these are some industry best practices across a few layers of general security that we all should be caring about. So data health, is your data good quality and is it highly available? User access, are you using role-based access controls, for example, and multi-factor authentic multi authentication and time-based one-time passwords so that the right people are, are having the right level of access. Data encryption, is your data encrypted both at rest and in motion? And then application access, are you using, for example, allow lists for IP connections? So taking care of these steps can really improve your security posture, making sure that you're prepared. And so, Rubrik solves the problem of data risk by converging data protection and data security into a single platform. So even if security defenses fail, your data, your most critical assets are still protected. And this is what we call security at the point of data. And so by securing your backup data against attack, Rubrik protects applications and keeps your business running.
And at the foundation is data protection. And data security clearly starts with protecting the data from attacks. So some key capabilities that this includes are, first thing is logical air gap architecture. And what that does is that prevents unauthorized access to your backup. The second thing is an immutable append only file system. And what that does is it prevents unwanted modification to your data. And third thing, multi-factor multi authentication. And what that does is, of course, it ensures the right people are allowed to enter your environment. So these are some of the, just a few of the, the core things that, uh, that make up the zero trust data protection capabilities in the platform. And Rubrik is a leader in data protection and part of our innovation is bringing zero trust to more workloads and to more environments. And we actually recently launched a solution that builds on our strategic partnership that we have with Microsoft. Uh, Rubrik Cloud Vault is built on Microsoft Azure. And what this solution does is it allows you to extend Rubrik Zero Trust data security to the cloud to keep immutable, uh, logically air-gapped copies of your data in a in an offsite location in the cloud. So it's logically air-gapped so that uh, you have a clean copy that is outside of your core IT environment in case anything were to happen to your core IT environment. And so you, you can recover uh, from that offsite location uh, in the event of a cyber incident. Rubrik Cloud Vault is a fully managed service and you can leverage the cloud storage within minutes and with a few steps ensure that your data is in that secure cloud bunker. Uh, because it's a fully managed service, it reduces operational complexities, uh, administrative burden. Uh, it's very uh, quick and easy to use and it's everything is consumed from and managed by Rubrik. And lastly, it comes at a predictable cost so that you can stay within your budget with a single bill that covers everything, including storage, read, API calls, and egress charges. So having an account isolated uh, data copy in a secure cloud vault separate from your core IT environment can give you peace of mind that you'll have your data readily available uh, for recovery in case you need it. So legacy backup approaches, they, they can be slow. And of course, time is money. And so here we have a backup system that is taking snapshots at periodic intervals. And if you are attacked, you need to be able to answer a series of questions in order to recover and, and ideally avoid having to pay that ransom. But with the earlier generations of backup solutions that aren't really built for today's ransomware era, it can be tough. You need to know, was your backup compromised? Are you able to find exactly where the malware is? Can you find what the last clean snapshot of this data was? Can you recover just what you need? And, and if you have trouble answering those questions, you might end up having to pay that ransom. And so that brings me to the fourth P of the, the four P's of reducing cyber risk, which is precision. So here, analytics and automation can be really helpful in making your ransomware response both quick and accurate. Analytics uh, can be used to, to identify what the blast radius of the attack was and also to identify what was the last known clean snapshot so that you can prevent malware from reinfecting your systems. And automation, particularly in the recovery process, can help you quickly and surgically restore the infected system. Sometimes it was, uh, it was just a specific component of your environment that was impacted and you don't wanna recover everything which would take a really long time. You just wanna surgically restore what exactly was infected. And so automation can help make that quick.
So let's come back to the legacy infrastructure and why we think that Rubrik offers a number of advantages. So Rubrik uses a zero trust architecture, which includes, as I was saying, the immutable file system, multi-factor authentication, and logical error gapping. So your data is highly protected. Uh, so next are some of our analytics capabilities, such as our ransomware investigation solution. It uses machine learning to detect changes, deletions, and encryption in your backup data. And this can help you identify what the blast radius of an attack was. Another analytics capability within the rubric platform is sensitive data discovery. And what this does it, is it automatically detects sensitive data and it has about the product has about 60 built in analyzers, which are aligned to some of the most common policy frameworks like GDPR, HIPAA, etc. And this lets you assess your data exposure risk and act upon it. You also have the ability to, to define custom analyzers. So this is for finding data that's particularly sensitive, like customer data, passport numbers, credit card numbers, patient data, etc. Threat hunting is a capability that can identify when and where malware was introduced. So by using this, incidents can then be contained so that they don't end up reinfecting your environment. And lastly, on the recovery front, the solution has a comprehensive set of recovery options, including the ability to live mount and instantly recover so that customers can get back up and running quickly. So as I've been saying, technology is just one component of reducing cyber risk overall. And I wanted to touch on a couple of different service offerings. Uh, the first one being customer experience manager. So we have a dedicated professional who can partner with you and perform key functions across three main areas. The first one is ensuring that security best practices are being followed and performing health checks. And what we recommend is a, a monthly cadence for these health checks. And this is just to, to help make sure that your security posture is as strong as it can be. Onboarding and adoption. So this is to make sure that you're getting the maximum possible value from your rubric investment and also collaboration and strategic planning. So that includes doing things like quarterly business reviews and even things like roadmap discussions. The second service offering that I wanted to touch on is the uh, rubric ransomware response team, should you ever need it. So we have a dedicated group within rubric that's kind of like a SEAL team that works with organizations on recovery. So not only does the software do its job, but we do have a team of technical people that works 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So when you invest in rubric, it's not just the, uh, it's not just the great technology that you're getting. We also provide a broader set of service offerings to, to help make sure that your organization is able to maximize its cyber resilience and remain unstoppable in the face of ransomware. We also do have a unique offering to help you manage cyber risk, and this is a ransomware recovery warranty. And this is the first of its kind ransomware recovery warranty. It's something that we announced last year. And the way that this works is that if you are hit by ransomware and for whatever reason you cannot recover data that was secured by rubric, we warrant up to $5 million in recovery related expenses. And so we recently expanded this ransomware recovery warranty to also cover data that's protected in rubric cloud vault. That's the fully managed service built on Azure. So regardless of whether your data is protected on premises, uh, on an appliance or in the cloud, know that it's backed up by the industry's most robust ransomware recovery warranty.
Lastly, I just wanted to make a quick plug for the recognition that Rubric has received from analysts like Gartner, Forrester, and Forbes. So we are recognized as a leader in this space and we really look forward to continuing to innovate in securing critical data and maximizing your cyber resilience. And so if you'd like to learn more, I encourage you to please get in touch. Thank you. Oh, Veer, thank you so much for that awesome presentation. Uh, tons of great information for our audience out there. And we have a lot of questions coming in. So I want to get to as many of those as we can. Um, I'm going to start with this one here because this is actually the first time I've seen this question in a little while. Uh, we have an audience member who has said that they are currently in the middle of a ransomware attack. And they're wondering if you have any thoughts on how they can get started. Now, obviously, we're not providing any specifics. So maybe if we can just uh, sort of address it as what do you do? What's step one when, when you're in it? Sure. Well, that's a pretty open-ended question, but I, I think some, some important things to do if you, once you discover that you have been impacted by an incident is to first understand what was impacted. Can you quickly and accurately assess what was the blast radius of the attack, for example? And then second question you'd want to ask yourself is what data was impacted in this attack? Was it, uh, was it really critical data? Was it sensitive customer information, for example, or was it less critical information where maybe if it was, you might just be able to, to tell the, tell the attacker to take a hike. And then the next thing that you'd want to do is, of course, turn to your backup platform to assess whether your data is still healthy there and then uh, and then attempt to make a recovery as quickly as possible. But also being sure to know that once you're that when you are attempting that recovery, that you're confident that the backup that you're recovering from is clean. And so when that backup data is clean, you can be confident that you won't end up uh, exacerbating the issue by reinfecting your environment. All right. Well, thank you, Veer. Some really great answers and, and action steps for our audience out there. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough question, um, and I appreciate you digging into that. Uh, next question here, we have an audience member wondering if Rubrik has any solutions for mainframes. Well, we, we secure data across many different environments. I, I, I'll, have to, I'll have to check on that and, and get back to you. But some of the data that we protect includes uh, includes databases, Oracle, SAP, etc. Uh, let me let me check on the technical details regarding whether mainframes are are included. Okay, well, thanks very much for taking some time to look into that for us, Veer. I know the audience will appreciate that. Uh, and let's see, let's take another question here. Uh, what are the most common mistakes that you see organizations make in incident response? And how did they solve it? I love that question. Yeah, I, I would go back to saying what I've mentioned a few times, which is when you're in the heat of trying to respond to attack, you're, it's a race against the clock. And, and in recovering, like everybody has backup data, but I think it's a common pitfall to to use a very recent copy of, uh, of that backup data, which isn't guaranteed to be clean. Because when you're attacked, sometimes that malware might've been latent for, for weeks or even months before the malicious code was actually executed. And so if you end up restoring data from a very recent snapshot that you aren't confident is clean, that malicious code might still be there in your system and it might still activate and continue to cause problems. So I think that's a major one to be aware of. Okay, sounds good. Uh, our next question, and I love that somebody asked this, somebody's got their forward thinking hat on today. Uh, question here for you, Veer, what is next? What is next in the field of ransomware preparedness? What solutions uh, should we be watching for? What trends are you excited about? Yeah, we're continuing to, to support more and more uh, workloads and environments. We have Microsoft 365, for example, uh, the ability to uh, to perform some of those analytics capabilities, not just on 
uh, backup data that's on premises, but also data that's that's secured in other environments like cloud. So we're constantly innovating on on that front. I, I would also want to repeat myself regarding um, the ability to to hunt for threats, and so that's that's something that we uh, we've come out with and are and are continuing to improve on, but. How do you look at your backup data to, to find out what malware is there, you know, recognizing different patterns from different malware attacks that have happened in the past and, and to give you confidence that, that you know when malware was introduced. Uh, that's a key one that I think is going to be important in helping organizations respond to, to ransomware going forward. Thank you so much, Vera, for all these incredible answers. We are running pretty close to the end of time here, so we're going to have to wrap it up very quickly. But I'm going to sneak in this one last question because I think it's something that a lot of us have thought about, wondered about, uh, and may not actually be as familiar with as we would like to believe. So let's do a quick level set here as we wrap it up. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could give us some information here on what does a ransomware attack actually look like? What does it entail and how does it spread? Yeah, good question. So anatomy of an attack, there's many different ways that an attacker can actually get into your system. Usually it's, uh, I mean, some ways that it could be is with compromised credentials. You could, I mean, it could come through unpatched software. A lot of people are using the VPNs more and more. And, and if uh, if there's a vulnerability in there, that's, uh, that's an opportunity for an attacker to uh, to get in. A lot of uh, in the legacy world, which uh, in which a lot of open network protocols were being used, uh, that introduces vulnerabilities. And in contrast to having a true zero trust approach, that's uh, that's fully secured with with everything like multi-factor authentication and time-based one-time passwords. So that's another way that attackers can uh, can get into get into an environment of course things like phishing etc the method of of uh, of stealing credentials unpatched vpns remote desktop protocols things like that there's a number of different ways attackers can actually get into your system all right well thank you so much Vera. thank you for answering that last question i think a lot of folks out there really appreciated hearing that answer again sometimes you know the the 101 understanding what a ransomware attack actually is helps us then as we're thinking about how we're going to respond so um thank you to all of our audience members who asked some great questions and and for uh sticking around to answer those fear it has been so much fun chatting with you and i think now we're going to keep things rolling along so let's uh let's get the poll question up here let's let's get some questions out for all of you in the audience All right, so there it is. That's the poll. What additional information would you like to get about the rubric solution? So we just got a lot of great info, and I know that there's a lot of questions that we still didn't get to. And again, I will remind you of this. We do send all the questions asked over to the teams after we wrap. So if they don't get to you on live chat during the uh, EcoCast today, if we don't get to it in a live session, uh, you will get a follow-up over email. So keep those questions coming in. In the meantime, another great way to make sure you can get the information that you need is to click right there on that poll to let Rubric know what information they can send you and how you would like them to follow up with you. While you guys are clicking on that poll, uh, I'm also going to remind you to head on over to the handout section. Make sure you click on the Rubric link. It's going to take you to their website. There are some incredible resources there for you. Highly, highly recommend spending some time getting to know their resource center, uh, clicking around on some links, book a demo, sign up for some future events. Whatever you have in mind, there's some cool stuff there. So go and check that out. Uh, okay, now we are going to give away a prize. I am going to remind you again that you do need to be here live and present with us on the EcoCast in order to win. Our very first lucky winner of a $300 Amazon gift card today is Chris Tilpow of North Carolina. Chris Tilpow of North Carolina, congratulations on your $300 Amazon gift card. Now, as always, we will be in touch about claiming your prize after we wrap up the webinar today. Don't forget there are still two more chances to win, plus that best question gift card from each session. So keep asking questions, and we will be looking at all of the questions asked after we wrap, and we will follow up with those best questions asked. All right, well, folks, 
I have, I have some news because today's EcoCast is short and sweet, but boy, does it pack a punch. Here we are already at our very last session. Now, it is going to be jam-packed with cool content and fun takeaways. So I'm very excited to introduce you all to our last two speakers of the day, and that's Tim Christen, Solution Sales en Executive, excuse me, Security at ServiceNow, and Carl Klesik, Director of Product Marketing Security Operations at ServiceNow. Tim and Carl, thank you so much for being here with us today to close out this absolutely fascinating conversation. I am so looking forward to hearing your presentation. I know we're gonna do some Q&A uh, with the audience at the end. So the platform is all yours. Uh, I think, Carl, you're going to kick us off. Take it away. Thank you, and appreciate the time. We're looking forward to uh, discussing with you ransomware today. Um, as mentioned, Tim and I have spent a fair amount of time and have focused a lot on what you can do with ransomware, not just from a defense, but also from a proactive uh, approach. So one of the things we wanted to touch on is, it, you know, as much as this continues to grow, and it does, um, it continues to be a huge driver and ongoing threat. 2021, 2022, forecast for 2023 and what we've seen so far continue to be a big hitter. Tim, did you want to chime in on some of this and looking forward to sharing this with our audience? Yes, thanks, Carl. And hello, everybody. Um, Tim Christen, Financial Services Security uh, Specialist here at ServiceNow. And uh, first, I, I'd, like to tell you, I'd like to tell you a story and give you a bit of encouragement in the next few minutes. If you find yourself in a position of having to respond to ransomware, there are several def several defensive techniques that you can enable on ServiceNow's security platform to avoid uh, being threatened by ransomware. And being in the financial services, ransomware continues to be a major th threat across the industry. And there's a lot of signals throughout your security incident response practice that will give you advance notice that a ransomware attack is happening. The most powerful move you can do today is to put all your security tools in one place, and that would be the ServiceNow security platform. As a platform, think, think of your phone with all your recipes, emails, TV, financials, photos. It's all in one place, and you didn't have to do one thing. It's all there in the palm of your hand, and that's what ServiceNow is for security and in this discussion for ransomware. So now let's and discuss that leads, that leads us perfectly into looking at those four stages, Tim, because like you're saying that that discovery and putting all that data into one place, that's exactly where we start here. Yeah, exactly, Carl. Well said. Um, so now let's discuss the four stages of ransomware. It all starts by understanding your assets and the business criticality of those assets. We'll double click on that uh, later in the uh, discussion. The second stage is protecting and establishing control of your processes uh, to test attack scenarios and to monitor security indicators. The third stage is how to respond to that attack, defining how you communicate with everybody impacted by the attack and by what means. And the final stage is to study what went wrong, identify the root cause and establish new controls immediately. So as we double click on that first part, as far as visibility, uh, to anticipate uh, an attack, it's critical that we give security teams visibility into all the hardware and software in the organization. You know, one of the best pieces of information you can give a security team is who owns this asset. This visibility also provides critical end of life asset data to security teams to anticipate when to retire and when to replace assets. Now here you can see the mapping of these assets, identifying uh, a portion of a network. This is really cool because you can see this vertically and horizontally to give the intelligence of the infected assets and the related services upstream and downstream. You also must assess the business criticality of the targeted ransom assets. For example, you have two assets, two IP connected assets. One is a lobby fish aquarium connected with an uh, IP connected feeding system. And the second is an SAP financial server. They might have the same severity when it comes to vulnerability ratings, 
but it's important for you to assess the criticality and most importantly, the context of that asset. You can do that with ServiceNow Security Incident Response uh, is in your and also your master asset database. This, what we've just laid out here, gives you command and control of your of vulnerable attack surface. And that business criticality, like you described, Tim, that's one of the most important pieces that often can be overlooked, right? And going through these steps and making sure you're capturing the criticality just as much as the, the identification, et cetera, is just critical to make sure that you are staying ahead of this and making the right moves. Yeah, great point, Carl. So now let's move into the second phase that we were talking about uh, to defend against ransomware, and it's to harden your attack surface, to bring all of your infrastructure, all of your applications, and all of your cloud vulnerabilities into a single view. And you can also bring all of the misconfigured items in your organization as well. Misconfigured items can be open ports, unauthorized software, weak passwords, just to, just to name a few vulnerabilities. And you can do that in the single pane of glass here uh, at ServiceNow. This is the exciting aspect when we think about this, Tim, when you go through this is being able to tie in MITRE to where you really get those insights as to what an attack could look like before you even get there. Yeah, the, the really cool thing about this is you, you need to understand who is attacking you, you know, and why are they attacking you and how they are attacking you. So in MITRE, uh, the why are they attacking you are referred to as tactics and how they're attacking you are techniques. And MITRE also knows by industry who attacks on a regular basis insurance companies, who attacks wealth management companies, who attack, attacks big banks. So this heat map you see here really brings that to life. And it gives you superb capabilities to help your team defend against ransomware and highlights uh, the detection and mitigation coverage of across MITRE. You can also use human found techniques such as pen testing and bug bounty programs. Well said, Tim. And of course, monitoring, no exception to the rule. If that's not ongoing and that's not put into a risk factor, uh, you're not seeing the complete picture. We, and you, absolutely right, Carl. And with capabilities like software exposure assessments, you can quickly identify things like zero day vulnerabilities related to real software that you have inventoried and deployed across your enterprise. Um, we can also combine this with the software bill of material capabilities that can ensure, you know, your supply chain and your application development teams that they have patched critical vulnerabilities and you can demand key security indicators be met from each of your vendors. And another really interesting aspect of ServiceNow security operations is we're vendor agnostic. Here you see the six major workflows in security incident response. And if you're just getting started or you have very mature parts of your security practice, we're going to meet you where you are in your journey. This allows you to orchestrate playbooks for minor and major security incidents. And one of the really nice things when all of this is said and done, our post incident review documents every second and step in the process. And this is one area that often gets, I don't want to say ignored him, but certainly it's a challenge to do, right? Which is all those different stakeholders throughout the enterprise that, and could be across the globe. How do we make sure we're aware of what's going on and what those next steps are and et cetera, and how they could be impacted? Yeah, that's the important thing. Just to just, you have to have a plan to communicate across all your stakeholders, your customers, your media, and most importantly, your regulators. And this is where with ServiceNow, we have, uh, you know, a capability in major security incident management to tie all those folks in. And Tim will touch on that a bit more. So we've done a lot so far. What do we do with that? How do you go ahead and when we think of the steps and the cycle that Tim described when we when we first got started, where do you go with that? Yeah, and the final stage is after a, a ransomware attack, uh, you wanna train your systems and practice to recognize real threats. So with predictive intelligence, 
uh, a single system of record and real time reporting, you can help off help, help defend against any future threats. You know, in financial services, customers are now executing on quote unquote platform first programs that challenge the status quo to prove what you're currently doing cannot be done on ServiceNow's platform before they approve any point solutions off the platform. Uh, I had a customer tell me last week that they were going to uh, approach this year with ruthless automation. And that's what we're seeing right now in the markets, especially given all these threats that uh, all all these big organizations are, are coming under. Um, and, you know, as far as ServiceNow is concerned, we say challenge accepted. Well said. So, so if you think about everything that we've covered, it, and, and I'll touch base a little bit here more, Tim, is that, um, you know, this is a good example of the cycle when we say train the system. This is everything we've gone through. You've gone through the visibility. You've gotten the different insights like we touched on with Meyer and others. Everything is driven through that, that single system of record like we touched on the reporting. That's really a lot of the full cycle, even when you look at this slide. And one of the key pieces that we do at ServiceNow is be able to tie them in. I mentioned major security incident management. It's that capacity to involve all those folks that are actually all those different teams throughout the enterprise that can be impacted and are a part of the resolution of ransomware and giving them the insights, the access and the communication via Teams and SharePoint, et cetera, to constantly be tying in with each other and checking on status. That's really what makes it so that you're adapting newer processes, newer workflows that really reflect what happens in real life with these type of attacks. So that's a, a very exciting outcome when we say train the system. And to this point here, what we've covered on is so much of what can be done proactively with the hygiene and planning that Tim talked about. So in other words, that ability to go ahead and address vulnerabilities so that you don't have that huge backlog. And that's a real proactive hygiene and some of our biggest sources, that monitoring, because let's face it, phishing is still a huge, uh, a huge inroad for so much of it results in ransomware and other major attacks. So all these areas and that attack analysis that we touched on with MITRE, that ability to understand where they would do and what they would do, even to the level like Tim described, of right down to a typical industry approach that they would apply. So knowing those types of tactics and techniques help you stay ahead of it and quite frankly, do your planning to go ahead and prevent it at times. Um, and then those workflows that you can tie in that went across like I touched on. And Tim, do you want to touch on some of what goes on with, uh, you know, on the containment side and the cleanup? Yeah, one of the one of the really interesting parts of of um, ServiceNow security is the the um, ability when you're in the platform. We have these role based um, um, permissions to think of it as a one way mirror. So when we tell somebody to go contain something or go clean something up, uh, they don't need to know why, and you're actually more secure on the platform in ServiceNow security incident response or vulnerability response. Um, than you are off the platform. We see a lot of, you know, legacy on-premise solutions that have been in place for a very long time. And actually, if you put your stuff into the cloud, you and your team are actually more secure than what you've done on a legacy side of the house. And even amongst yourselves, you could have certain subgroups of your team to say only uh, a handful of people get to see this incredibly sensitive security information. So there's, there's a lot um, to talk about for rapid containment and, and cleanup that we'd be happy to uh, talk more about in the Q&A uh, at the end of this uh, presentation. Thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. The last thing, and, and Tim, I'll let you expand on this, but the last thing, you know, we wanted to, to touch on here as far as, uh, you know, thinking about prevention is the kill chain, right? And, and it ties a bit of what we talked in in MITRE and Know Your Adversaries Threat Tactics, a, a very bold statement, but one that makes it so that you truly can be preventative, like we've touched on a couple of times here uh, going through this presentation. So Tim, if you want to hit a bit more here on the, the kill chain and, and how this plays out with some of these capacities and capabilities. Sure. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, I was um, having a, a, a nice um, meeting last week with three different um, major financial firms in the U.S. And I, in preparation for this uh, discussion, I said, do you have any advice for ransomware? And they they said the kill chain. They said it's it's test test proven, time proven, 
And the beautiful thing about that is you can take the major, major steps inside the kill chain and put them and define them in the platform. So you know you have that multi-layered approach to defending um, your organization. There's um, a company that I'm thinking of that got hit with ransomware recently. And when they finally did the um, final report, the, the, the root cause was very, very weak passwords. Well, if you had those systems in service now, and as I was saying earlier, to measure those misconfigured items that it might not adhere to your password policy, you can get ahead of that and you don't have to have somebody exploit that. But um, the really encouraging thing, and that's why he said, we wanted to give you some encouragement with this discussion is, is you have a lot of things available to you uh, on platform when it comes to the kill chain and def defending your, your organization. Thank you, Tim. Sure, Carl. All right. So folks, a, you know, a reminder, we, we touched on so much, but the reality is so much of this about the automation, the visibility, those insights that you heard Tim just talk a little more details about and what we can do, that's all allows you to go ahead and really connect security to the rest of the enterprise. And why do we do that? And why is that important? And why do we have that type of focus on service now? It's addressing these type of incidents like ransomware and others that are truly enterprise impactful, right? So you have that approach where you need to tie in so many areas of the organization. So that's a, a real strength of ours because at the end of the day, um, those workflows, you know, touch so many areas when addressing uh, something such as ransomware, driven by security, driven by risk, driven by uh, HR, driven by legal, driven by so many uh, different groups in the organization. So that's a lot of what we wanted to make sure that you had some good understandings and insights of uh, here today. And one of the things we want to do now is Tim, is Tim has covered some real great information to give you some some thoughts on not just the, the core steps to defending them ransomware and some of the prevention you can do, uh, but also some of the deep insights in, in what you need to gain and where you need to focus. So let's have an opportunity now to go ahead and uh, Tim, let's draw you in for some Q&A and looking forward to that. That sounds great, Carl. Let's get it started. Yes, definitely, Tim. Love the attitude. We are going to get that started in just one moment. I first want to point out to everyone out there in the audience that we do have a poll up on the screen for you. And what we're looking for is what additional information you would like to get about the ServiceNow solution. So we just heard an excellent presentation, lots of good insight, and there is so much more to dig into which is why I see all, all these questions pouring in. But another great way to make sure that you get your answers is to click on that poll. And I, I promise you, future you is going to be grateful that you did because you will get the information that you need handed right to you from the ServiceNow team. So go ahead and click on that. While you're doing that, Tim and I are going to dive into some of these audience questions. Tim, are you ready? Hey, Jeff, absolutely. <laughs> Locked and loaded. I like it. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to start with this one here from Brandon, uh, because I think this is a great sort of place to start. Uh, Brandon's asking, how can financial services organizations assess their current security posture and identify areas for improvement? That's a great question, Brandon. Thanks for that. Um, there's, there's several ways you can assess it. There's, there's um, outside firms that do uh, cybersecurity assessments to uh, judge your level of maturity. And that's really what it comes down to is, is at ServiceNow, we, we call it a journey. So whether you're the most sophisticated financial services firm in the world or you're just getting started, um, there's assessments you can do both externally and internally to do that. Um, and it really is the kind of the level of automation. And that's, that's the name of the game here in 2023 is, is how, what level of automation are you doing within your organization? So, Hopefully that helps and we can dig into some more of uh, those details with some of these other questions we've got pouring in here. Okay, I love it. Um, you know, another question that I saw that is something we hear all the time, especially when we're talking to our friends in finance or in healthcare, and that's compliance. So Jason is wondering, can you give us a little insight into ServiceNow security incident response products could help with compliance reporting and demonstrate compliance with regulations like GDPR or HIPAA? Sure, Jason. Yeah, beautiful question. Um, and that's one of the things that we're most proud about in the security incident response. Um, we have a thing in, in the platform called post-incident review. 
and that will help you with com with any regulatory uh, requirements. It'll tell you down to the second. It's it's so dialed in to say, you know who you know when when did you become aware of this incident? Who was notified? What did you do? How did you do it? And then how do you resolve it? And the beautiful thing about the documentation is that it's actually admissible in court. So it's it's uh, incredibly well documented. And that's one of the things that people should understand and take away from this discussion is you're more secure in the cloud than you are outside the cloud. So when you have like on-premise mm -hmm. resources or some of the big financial services firms have hundreds of security products. And the problem that presents is the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So as far as compliance is concerned, mm -hmm. Like patch orchestration, for example, has different metrics um, than your infrastructure um, vulnerabilities. So all of those metrics are available at the click of a button inside the platform. I'm so glad you said that, Tim, because I, that's something that I think so many people have the exact opposite feeling, is that the cloud is unsafe and, and on-prem is. It's so interesting to hear kind of a different way of looking at, at that and that oversight and insight. You also happened to answer Jason's second question, which was about how ServiceNow can help with post-incident analysis. And, and you're saying that that's, that's a big part of, uh, of the service as well as helping with compliance. So that's great. Yeah, it is. And, and one, of the most, one of the most insightful things I can share with you guys this morning, gals this morning, is these are scoped applications. And when we say scoped applications on the platform, they're role-based. So think of like a one-way window. So if there's a security incident and something happened, you, ha you can tell another part of your organization that they have to go and help remediate. They don't need to know why uh, or what the root cause was, or even amongst yourselves to say, Jess and Tim are the only two people that can find these highly sensitive information, you know, kind of incidents that have happened. So again, it goes back to you're more secure. You don't have that offline. You're much more secure in the cloud than you are outside the cloud or on-prem. I like, yes, Chess and Tim should have all the security controls and access, I think is the key takeaway from that. Good strategy. Uh, <laughs> Let's keep moving. I'm going to ask another question here. Uh, how vulnerable are companies to ransomware attacks? Oh, that's a big question. Yeah. How, how vulnerable are companies to ransomware attacks, Tim? Yeah, there's, there's um, several kind of work streams as far as, you know, your, your core infrastructure, your IT infrastructure, your host kind of uh, attack surface. Then your cloud, you know, what are you doing for cloud security? And what are you doing for application security and how vulnerable are you? And then the fourth leg of that stool is where are all your misconfigured items? So there's been ransomware attacks just in the headlines in the last few weeks of, of um, millions and millions of dollars. And when you dig into the final result, it's because they had an incredibly weak password. So when you talk about misconfigured items, we're talking about, you know, unauthorized software, open ports, or, you know, very simple passwords that break what should be stronger policies for security. And, and that's how vulnerable they are. But the cool thing about ServiceNow is you can get those infrastructure vulnerabilities, those cloud vulnerabilities, those application vulnerabilities, and the misconfigured uh, security items all in a single dashboard. So you can drive that through the culture and, and the, the hierarchy of your organizations. All right. Well, a, a good answer to a big question that I just asked you. Um, I, I'm going to ask you now, Tim. I, I, this is I'm I'm really glad somebody asked this because I I'm curious about your answer. Um, could you share some insight into better defenses against ransomware? And I realize that's what we've sort of been talking about here, um, but but maybe I'm wondering if you can uh, give us either if you have something that uh, that you think is sort of a key takeaway for, for folks out there, and especially when we're talking about financial institutions that they should be considering. Sure, Jess, that's an excellent question. And, and since I am dedicated exclusively to financial services, I can help share some insights. Um, so both tactically, you know, the, obviously the cyber kill chain with the seven major steps and the three phases of the kill chain, are the tried and true uh, defenses of every organization. And I was having dinner with a couple huge financial institutions last week, and, and they said that's kind of their go-to. But also the 14 tactics of the MITRE ATT&CK framework 
which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, and the multiple techniques underneath those tactics to say who's attacking you, why are they attacking you, and how are they attacking you, really help build up the fences to help put you, you know, as the CISA uh, command of, of shields up is concerned. But at the end of the day, I think it's there's more organizational challenges than there are technical challenges. The technology is there. It's really just a matter of fighting against the culture and the, the status quo. Um, we see companies today saying, we're going to come in with a platform for strategy to say, we're not going to let you go by the, the shiniest object. We're going to say, if you can do this on the platform, you do it. And if you can't, then we might be able to give you permission to go buy something. But those are some of the defenses, both on a technical front, but also on an organizational front, how we're seeing seismic shifts in financial services. And financial services moves in herds, and we see this massive adoption of the cloud just to be in a much safer and higher ground. I want to, we're running a bit short on time now, uh, but I do want to sneak in this one last question because I think it, a lot of us are hearing that speed is now becoming the, you know, delineating factor between a successful response or not uh, and a successful attack. Uh, and, and the attacks are getting faster and faster and faster in and out before we know. So uh, can you give us some insight into the, the effect that you're seeing that trend towards speed, both from the attacks and from the response and how ServiceNow can help with that? Since I'm dedicated to financial services and the teams we are dedicated to financial services, we can see the gauntlet. And you see, uh, unfortunately, big financial organizations or small financial organizations, it takes them weeks and months even to assign vulnerabilities or to herd security incidents. But on the other end of the spectrum, we see people that are on the ServiceNow platform can assign hundreds of teams across the organization uh, security incidents or vulnerabilities within less than a second. And that's, that's, I mean, it's just, it's just a completely different universe as far as the ability to respond. And it's the posture. And as I said, it's, it's really more people have organizational problems. They don't have technology problems and other things such as automated patching. We have, you know, one of the biggest Achilles heels is I have this entire enormous thing that I have to patch and I have to do it manually. Well, there's technology in the platform that can correlate your patching with your vulnerabilities, and if that's if there's a match, it can automatically and bring those patching numbers way down. And of course, all the regulators are quite interested in the metrics to do that. So the ability to respond in sub-second response times versus days, weeks, and months is just an eternity. So, so that's uh, <laughs> the, the encouraging thing is the technology is there for people to do that. Well, I love that, and always good to end on a note of encouragement. And speaking of the technology being there, if somebody out there is ready to jump in with ServiceNow, they want to learn a little bit more and maybe get started, what do you recommend as their first step? Is to probably reach out to me, or um, ah, but, but also love it. but also just to just to understand um, the journey and to to take mm. a, a really. Um, 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 a self-assessment to say, are we, are we culturally ready to do this? Are we financially ready to do this? But at the end of the day, you know, the attack surface is the attack surface. And you, everybody on this call knows what's coming in inbound. And are you prepared? Are you always on the, on the kind of defensive side, on the back foot? So the best way to do it is to understand your level of automation. And I always say, Service now is like the phone in your hand. You've got everything in the world in the palm of your hand, and that's what service now is for security. Put all your stuff in one place and then get started. Boy, I love that. That's a great metaphor and, and an easy way for everyone to kind of understand what you've been saying here today. Tim, thank you so much for this incredible uh, conversation. Uh, thank you to you and Carl for the presentation, kind of kicking us off there. This has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate your time today. Happy to do it, Jess. Always a pleasure. <laughs>
All right. And for all of you out there that clicked on the poll, big thank you to you. Keep that up. Why don't you also move one click on over to the handouts tab and grab the ServiceNow link. You can snag the ebook when banking works. The world works. I love that. Five ways to automate uh, processes and drive new revenue and growth across your bank. So this is a great read. Uh, it helps you turn in. This is one of my favorite taglines. How to become a bank of the future. Yes, I love that. Uh, and that's what we're talking about, right? It's, there's all kinds of cool ways that you can move into the future, and there's opportunities that come with that, and there's also things to consider. So there's uh, you know safety cons considerations and security considerations as well as all the big and uh, and exciting opportunities. So go snag this ebook for some light afternoon reading after we wrap up our webinar here today. Uh, now a few of you asked about the prizes, so I am going to go ahead and give away our last prizes. We have uh, the last two $300 Amazon gift cards going to someone here live and present with us at the EcoCast, and that is Dennis Baracos of California, Dennis Baracos of California, and Michael Detzel of Ohio, Michael Detzel of Ohio. So that full list, Chris Till Powell of North Carolina, Dennis Baracos of California, and Michael Detzel of Ohio. Congratulations to all of you. We will be in touch about claiming your prizes after we wrap. Now, I do want to remind you all that there is also that best question ask card, and we will be looking over all of those uh, after we wrap today. Peter, thank you for that high five. I see you out there. Uh, and Gilbert sending some good vibes out there to all the winners. Love that. Love our, our, we have such a great crew out there today and always, all the days. Uh, all right. Well, I do want to remind you all, speaking of a great crew, if you're looking virtually around the room and thinking, man, this is fun. I'd like to do this. It is and you should. So come hang out with us. Uh, if you'd like to present on a summit, an EcoCast, a MegaCast, a webinar, a PanelCast, a DemoCast, boy, we have it all. Come hang out with Scott, David, Keith, myself. You can reach out at connect at actualtechmedia.com. We would absolutely love to have a conversation with you. All right. Well, with that, dun, 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 dun. on behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, I want to thank all of our speakers here with us today from Rubric and from ServiceNow for making this EcoCast possible. But on that note, a very special thank you to all of you for attending and for asking some great questions. I know sometimes it can be scary to ask a question because some questions feel like, well, maybe I should know this. Uh, and I think today we had a really great and open discourse. I had a lot of fun talking with all of you about some of these specific opportunities, but also these challenges when we're talking about security and ransomware preparedness within financial services and, and IT environments. There is so much to consider. There's a lot to worry about. There's a lot to be concerned about. But there's also a lot of information. And as Tim said, tools. There are, there's information and there's tools out there to help you. But it starts with us having these conversations. It starts with us sharing that information together and having this conversation together. So that's why I love it when we all get to come together and we get to pool our understandings, our experiences, our, our information, the tools we have, we love, we know, uh, and pull that information together in one place. So I hope that you have all gotten some interesting ideas and some tips. Maybe you're feeling a bit more informed or equipped to tackle that ransomware scourge, uh, which is just it isn't it going away, is it? You know, it's going to morph, it's going to change, might grow, might shrink, it might you know evolve, but it's not going to disappear. So that's why we keep coming together. That's why we keep having these conversations. Speaking of which, be sure to come back and have another one with me Tuesday, April 4th at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. We will be talking about protecting SaaS applications, security and data protection considerations. Ooh, so we're going to get sassy. On, I had to, sorry, on Tuesday, April 4th, that's noon Eastern Standard, 9 a.m. Pacific. Come join me for that conversation. Uh, should be a good one. Well, until the 4th or maybe tomorrow, if you're joining Scott for the panel cast, it's going to be a fun one, or whenever I get to see you next, I hope you have an absolutely beautiful rest of your day. <laughs>